Okay, so when you hear the term unlicensed game, what do you usually think of? I would assume usually something bad. A lot of unlicensed games had the same issues. Poor graphics, choppy frame rate, boring gameplay, usually something low quality. You might think of companies like Color Dreams who were making very mediocre games, but were there decent, or possibly even good, unlicensed games? Well, I have the answer. Let's take a look. What's up guys? It's Poger, coming at you with another video. So, I always really liked the name Codemasters. Think about it, what is a game? It's a program made with a bunch of lines of code. So the name Codemasters is really powerful, like we do it better than anyone else. With that said, we're going to be talking about an underrated game company. So if you enjoyed this video, feel free to leave a like, it helps out the YouTube algorithm. And if you enjoy retro content and obscure gaming stories, feel free to drop a subscription. It's only a small thing on your part, but it helps me out greatly. Anyway, I'm going to shut up now. Let's talk about Codemasters. So in the early 90s, the founder of Codemasters, Richard and David Darling, discovered the NES at the Consumer's Electronics Show. The brothers were familiar with various Commodore computers, but this was the first time they were introduced to the NES. They were impressed with what they saw and they wanted to start programming for it. Given that Codemasters was a UK-based company, they teamed up with Comerica in order to release games in the US. The only problem, Comerica didn't have a license from Nintendo, and they were not interested in becoming a licensee. The NES had a lockout chip that prevented unlicensed games from working, known as the 10NES chip. If you weren't an official Nintendo licensee, your games wouldn't work. But there were a few companies who were thinking outside of the box. One company, Tengen, who didn't agree with Nintendo's policies, circumvented the chip by illegally obtaining the patent information of the 10NES chip. Another company, Color Dreams, found a super primitive way to get around the chip. Their cartridges send a pulse of low voltage, which disrupts the chip and lets you play the game. Comerica was aware of these two methods, but they wanted to find a way to circumvent the lockout chip without using illegal methods or with voltage. In the UK, Codemasters bypassed the lockout chip by making double-ended cartridges similar to Game Genie, where you insert an officially licensed game over the unlicensed one. This bypassed the lockout chip and allowed consumers to play Codemasters games, but this method was inconvenient, and Comerica wanted to find a solution that didn't require inserting a second cartridge. This is when they came up with the switches. In the back of all of Codemasters games, there's a switch in the back of the cartridge where you can put it in position A or B. Using this method crashes the lockout chip and lets you play it. So now that they have a way to bypass the lockout chip, Codemasters, with their new partnership with Comerica, can now release their games in the US. So, typically unlicensed games are very low quality. Usually the graphics look bad, maybe there's some frame rate issues, terrible music. Unlicensed games usually don't hold up well compared to official titles. Is this going to be the case with Codemasters? Well, let's take an honest look at a couple of their original releases. So let's start off with Ultimate Stuntman. You go through numerous driving and platforming stages. In the platforming sections, the controls are pretty lousy. You can't shoot directly above you, and you have no control over the camera, and I feel like you should. The climbing stages are especially abysmal. It's annoying trying to control your character and the crosshair at the same time. But despite the issues, this is actually playable. The game offers a lot of variety, the graphics are well done, and the music is fantastic. Fortnite. 
For an unlicensed game, this is actually pretty well made. Now let's take a look at Big Nose the Caveman. It's a very simple platform where you get to the end of the stage and you fight a boss. The controls could be better. Your default attack has very short range and it's very difficult to time it correctly. I usually end up missing it and dying as a result. But thankfully you're able to pick up a projectile that greatly improves your range. You can also buy new items and abilities. Just like with the other game, the music is very good. And it's playable. It's a very basic game, but sometimes you gotta keep things simple. So both of these games really showed Codemaster's abilities. They were serious about making games on the NES. With that said, they would begin with their most ambitious project yet. So in the mid-80s, the company Galoob created a new line of toys called Micro Machines. These became super popular, and they were even more popular than Hot Wheels and Matchbox at one point. Micro Machines even made an appearance in Home Alone as one of Kevin's traps. With the popularity of Micro Machines, Codemasters made a licensing agreement with Galoob, giving them the green light to release a game tie-in. Codemasters games started off under the name California Buggy Boys, before they secured the license to Micro Machines, of course. And it drew some inspiration from the Commodore 64 game Rally Speedway. Here, it's a top-down perspective, and you can move your car in all directions using tank controls. Since Codemasters North America were official Nintendo licensees, they didn't have access to an NES development kit, or any official Nintendo documentations, so they were pretty much on their own. But despite that, they managed to create a finished product. Let's take a look. So right away, this game has great presentation. You can select a character and even the opponents, which is cool. You don't actually select what car you want, instead, each stage features a different vehicle. I figured they would give us an option to choose what car we want, but I actually like what they did here. The cars are not just visual sprites either, they each have their own attributes. Some are faster than others, some will explode much easier, and some will handle better in certain terrain. So your mission is to win the race, nothing fancy, but what's surprising is, the game actually keeps track of what place you're currently in, and the opponent's placements as well. This is actually pretty advanced for an NES game. Since it's Micro Machines, you're a small vehicle interacting with seemingly giant obstacles that would otherwise seem small to us. In most stages, you're racing on a table which is cluttered with all kinds of things, whether it's various foods in the kitchen stage or pencils and binders in the desktop stage. There's a lot of attention to detail here, and I love it. They really nailed the graphics. I really got a comment on the parallax scrolling here. The NES doesn't natively support parallax scrolling because there's only one background layer, but Codemasters came up with a creative trick. So the game uses animated tiles, let's say this is the tile right here, but they can only animate when you're moving. So if you're moving right, the tile will appear to also be moving to the right, but really it's just frame by frame animation. Same process if you're moving to the left. Now if you line up all these tiles in a row, it appears to look like parallax scrolling when it's in fact not. This is very impressive to see, especially from an unlicensed game company. So I was worried about the game using tank controls, but surprisingly, the handling is very good. Some of the stages I was breezing through as if I owned the place. Sometimes you can get stuck somewhere and it can be extremely detrimental. The game could have used a way to reset your vehicle position, similar to what you see in games like Need for Speed, but I'm not going to critique something like that because this is a much older game. So you would think a game like this, especially an unlicensed game, would be short, but surprisingly, there's 32 tracks here. 
Since there are many different vehicles and stages to explore, this game has a decent amount of replayability. It's not a perfect game though. I don't like the character designs at all. It looks like children drew these in art class. I also don't like that there's no music during the race, you just hear the sound of your vehicle. This is a shame because Codemasters games usually have great music, and this is a missed opportunity. The game can also get pretty frustrating because if you fall into a bottomless pit or water, you get penalized harshly to the point where you might lose the race. Especially in the later stages, just one fall will usually be an automatic loss. Overall though, Codemasters put the Micro Machines license to good use. This is a really ambitious title with nice visuals and fun gameplay. Not only is this a good unlicensed game, but this is just a good game. So when the game was finished, some ROM chips had already been completed and the game was ready to be released. But then they noticed a major problem. So right before Micro Machines was about to be released, a game-breaking glitch was discovered. By going in reverse during the first race, the game would crash. It was an easy task to perform, and any player who wasn't familiar with the game might go in reverse by accident. So with that said, how wasn't this caught sooner? The game was being tested beforehand, but none of the testers thought about going in reverse during the first race, so the glitch remained in the game. So, the developers faced a major problem. Some of the ROM chips that contained the glitch had already been manufactured, so they couldn't just simply fix it. They needed to find another way. So, they came up with a creative idea. They installed a device inside of the cartridge that was very similar to Game Genie that would override the glitch and allow you to play the game, glitch-free. With that problem alleviated, the game was released in 1991. It was met with critical acclaim. In IGN's Top 100 NES Games list, Micro Machines is ranked number 31, making it the highest rated unlicensed game on the list. Richard and David Darling were both impressed with the NES and wanted to start making games for it, but they didn't want to become a licensee, so they teamed up with Comerica and released games without Nintendo's approval. Unlicensed games generally have a bad reputation, but Codemasters' first batch of games were actually decent. It showed that Codemasters was serious about making games, so they worked on their biggest project yet, Micro Machines. This is an extremely ambitious title with great graphics, great controls, and fun gameplay. Unlicensed or not, this is a great game. Hey, thanks so much for watching guys. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like rating. It only takes a second and it gets my video noticed by more people. Also, if you enjoy my content, drop a subscription. That way you'll be notified when my next video comes out. Plus, it's completely free. Finally, drop a comment if you have any questions, suggestions, or just want to share your gaming experiences. This greatly helps the YouTube algorithm and I'm usually pretty good at replying back. Anyway, have a good one guys.